girl on marijuana She said if I'm not stoned I don't want her But she got so paranoid Her place I would avoid As in love with a girl on marijuana Emily Vogel, <laughs> thanks so much for taking the time to talk today. Yeah, it's good finally chatting with you. I know. So I got to ask, starting off, have you done a lot of interviews? No, I have not. I've only done a couple podcasts and interviews so far. How did they go? How is it being interviewed for like, you, you know, if it's something that's new to you somewhat, like how, did, what was it like for you? How did you like it? Well, I have zero media training, which <laughs> I guess is makes things fun. Uh, but I just don't don't quite know what I'm getting myself into. So sometimes I feel like I have found myself getting led down conversation paths and not knowing how to steer it one way or the other. But for the most part, I've had a lot of fun just getting to know people. Um, the one thing is, there's just so much to say about everything about me, and you can only fit so much in. So just getting to have a nice chat. Yeah, I mean, I've talked to everybody from, you know, members of Megadeth to a jazz singer in New York City to um, I interviewed an actress who was in a B-rate horror movie called Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. And it was incredible. And you're my first comedian. Oh, awesome. I'm honored. Thank you. It's interesting because a lot of times I talk to musicians let's say 90% of the time and being a musician myself and a music writer, I always know what to go in. You know, I feel like I know what I'm getting into talking to a comedian. Like I really had to sit down and actually like, I'm not even gonna lie. Like I had to like type shit up and like, cause I was okay. I want to make sure I'm coming. Like I'm, I'm going to be like, so what's your favorite band? You know, although <laughs> I might ask that, but I needed to kind of educate myself a little more. And um, so I was doing some, looking up on you and whatnot, you know, some total Google stalking and whatever. And um, I found a YouTube clip of you conducting practice. I am not going to lie. I am such a fucking stoner, but I watched that whole fucking video and I was just like, wow, like it was like the best meditation I'd had, but like, that was amazing. <laughs> I hope, I do hope one day my conducting skills can come into uh, fruition or for some reason or another. Um, <laughs> but no, it's, uh, yeah, I took, when I was mu doing music education, one of the first things they have you do is conducting, which is they really should have just really tested me on the piano first, because that's honestly why I quit, <laughs> because there was no way I was going to pass on my piano test. But um, we did conducting conducting class, and it was so fun. I loved it. And sometimes I'll still be in the car and just bopping around to 4-4 four, four count. <laughs> That's not what I was expecting to find when I Googled Emily Vocal, but I was like, that was incredible. I did find some cool, like a couple of videos of your performance, but mainly your stuff is all on uh, social media. Yeah. And I've kept a lot of my things off online, offline, I guess, um, because I did improv for the longest time and then I'm newer to stand up. And so... So many of those performances, they're just never filmed, or if they are, I don't want them online. <laughs> so, um, so there's so much that with doing live performances, I think the beauty of comedy is that whoever gets tickets and whoever's in that room that night gets the full experience, gets the show, and then I put out little clips and moments from the show. But um, if you want the whole thing, if you want all of the, the extra juicy stories that will probably never go online, that's in person. If you want all this, you got to come get it. You know, <laughs> exactly. But it's, you know, it's so funny because I stumbled upon you actually on TikTok. And a couple of things that I find the most prevalent, at least in my own algorithm, you know, is I see a lot of music, I see a lot of cool conspiracy UFO theories, and a lot of funny stuff, you know, like prank sites, yeah, you know, joke sites, you know, uh, comedians. I've, uh, I discovered uh, Morgan Gallo the same way. To me, it's just such an interesting, but yet it's still a new thing for me to see that this is a way that people are connecting with their audiences. So what has your connection been to people through TikTok? Are you finding that you're getting some attention or some people that are like, hey, you know, I like your stuff? Yeah, TikTok is, TikTok sometimes it doesn't even seem real where you're just putting things out into this universe machine and it's a lottery of if it's gonna get 
a hundred views or a hundred million and you never know which one it is. So you, you kind of want to make them good, but then you, you also never know. So then I, I end up making dozens of them that just go out into the universe. <laughs> so, um, so with TikTok, I have, I have met a few other comics and that's where I get, um, uh, where I can follow a lot of my inspirations and stay up to date with uh, like other, um, other comics and what they're doing. I love listening to podcast clips and that's usually where I catch them where I don't have time to, I already listen to like 20 different podcasts. And so I want to listen to everybody's, but that's how I um, find a lot of them. Networking wise, I have made a few contacts on TikTok, but usually Instagram has been the place for um, for bookings and for meeting other comics. And that's always our calling card where you meet another comic at the club. And then at the end, it's, oh, what's your Insta? And then you just swap phones. All of these different platforms. <laughs> like I said, like, I'm an old fart. So like when I was playing in a heavy metal band in like 90, like it was like handing out flyers outside of a club, begging people to come to your show, you know? And now all of a sudden you've got these incredible ways to just reach out to people and I think that when I look at this, it, it makes sense what you were saying, because I'm sure Instagram is a little easier to be like, oh, here, reach out to me on Instagram versus are you on TikTok? Because I feel like st people are still not there's probably a lot more people that are doing Instagram, you know, than there are doing Facebook anymore. For, but TikTok is still kind of this thing people are trying to figure out from an entertainment side. Do you see yourself growing more into that? Or do you feel like that something like Instagram is more of a stable place to be? Yeah, I would love for um, to keep turning out TikToks and have that grow to be the bigger platform, since I think that that is the biggest way to grow. When we look at a lot of the comedians who've made it big the last few years, um, so many of them started in the pandemic and then by 2021, 22, they're doing movies and TV or um, get, getting out on the main stages of all of the big comedy clubs. Um, so I think that is really the vehicle for um, for reaching wider audiences, especially when you're touring and then you can do targeted ads or mm -hmm. figure out how to how to find people in different parts of the country. But um, but I do I do see TikTok um, growing more as it's just m much more discoverable. Um, versus Instagram reels are great, um, but sometimes they're, uh, they can be really divisive. I feel like the comment sections on reels are a lot harsher than TikToks, in my opinion. <laughs> Being in entertainment, you obviously have to be thick skinned. Is it hard still, regardless, to see some like harsh criticism or maybe even some snarky, ugly criticism or do you look do you look at that and go that's ammunition for me like i'm gonna flip that around turn that in just a bit and that's how i'm gonna like a catharsis of sorts yeah i i've been thinking about how working on bits on that and some of when a clip goes viral and i had one that it just went in all directions on instagram and then as soon as it settled down it popped off on facebook and then everyone on facebook had something to say and it was all if you whittled down the like 800 comments or whatever it would be about the same 10 a variation of the same 10 comments and the same 10 insults and they weren't mm -hmm. that original and it was so silly so for the most part i i was able to I, i'm able to just look at them and just kind of shrug it off my shoulders and carry on but in a certain mode or if i start my day off um if i st start my day off on the wrong foot i really do have to be careful in the mornings because i feel like sometimes i get really fired up if it's the first thing i see for the day so um i did definitely spend like an hour just clapping back at people one day and then i was <laughs> like what did that do these people don't care you know i can go to their profile and roast them if i want but that's i don't want to spread the negativity mm -hmm. but um the worst though is sometimes i did find a couple people with mutual friends and i would be like who is this guy <laughs> a related <laughs> troll i love it yeah with like one mutual follower or something and they're like i think we went to high school together like 12 years ago i'm like okay never mind but so it gets like, frustrating you're a jerk then you're a jerk now you know so exactly. <laughs> yeah exactly she was like he was pretty weird then too <laughs> so <laughs> I don't feel that bad anymore, but that's the thing. They're, they're just behind a screen and mm -hmm. a lot of the, a lot of the comments, um, I do get a lot. It's about either being a woman or weight. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And if I were to lose weight, my com- it'd just be about being a woman anyway. So, you know, give them something to talk about. In the music industry, obviously, you know, or in, in the entertainment industry, I guess, for that matter, is that it's, it's always been and still is a very male dominant world. I've definitely appreciated and seen the growth in female artists, but there's still a lot of challenges and a, and a lot of inappropriateness and pain that comes with that. So, so like, how do you deal with the inappropriateness of the things that come up? Because I guarantee you men don't get those kind of the comments from women. Do you know what I mean? Cause women are classy. You guys have a little bit of couth to you, you know, like men don't, you know, so. Yeah. Every women can, women will be very, um, not passive aggressive, but very cutting where they'll be like, oh dear, you need to get your health in check. Or like, is she happy? I'm like, what? <laughs> where are you getting this from? <laughs> so they, they have very underhanded ways of bringing things up. But um, with men, yeah, it can be like one way or the other. And because sometimes I'll get more raunchy comments too that I'm not looking for those either. Um, and then I get like people defending me in the comments, but like, in ways that I would not want them to (laughs) by like, you know, attacking them and just spreading the negativity. And um, so it gets kind of ugly sometimes, but um, yeah, some of the comments where it's just like, comes from a place of like, who hurt you? (laughs) But, (laughs) um, but in person, um, I have a great group of women that I work with regularly and just um, I network with a lot of comedians in general, but we have a women's brunch that we do once a month in, in Los Angeles mm-hmm. um, of just any comedians of any experience level can come to. And that's really fun. Um, and so we really do try to support each other. And there sometimes are um, women's only open mics or mm-hmm. um opportunity or or even shows just so that um, there is sometimes a space where it's a safe space and um, and audiences who come know that um, it's unfortunate to say that oh this this is a safe space but uh, you sometimes don't know what people are going to say and there definitely are women who say out of pocket things at shows but typically typically it will be men who just come out with things that I don't, I'm like, I wouldn't even type that online on like a burner account and you're saying that online you're saying that into a microphone. <laughs> I feel like, again, in in any level of it, whether it's art, music, poetry, comedy, whatever, there's always going to be kind of, there's never just one genre of comedy or genre of music. Like, you know, it's all going to kind of fork out and everything. Like, is there a specific comedy or style of comedy that you, before you got into it, you looked at and you said, yeah, I don't want to go down that road as a comic and why? Um, I, I, I personally don't, would not want to get into roast comedy. I know that that's making a comeback. Mm -hmm. I think that I could be good at roasts, but I don't want to be (laughs) aware. Um, I know how to hurt people. Like I know how to have the cutting words if I wanted to, but then you can't take that back. And like some of those will, when they're going to bed at night, they're going to be thinking about that. And I just don't want to be part of that. Um, I do appreciate a really good roast. I do love one, um, but that's one that I can think it, and I know it's funny, but the second I say it, I feel bad. At us. And you have to have that conviction to to, to really deliver it, you know, like to say, yes. like, like to be okay with the fact that you said something that's probably going to make someone cry in the shower later. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's supposed to be like a level of camaraderie versus like, if I really, I could roast people I don't like, but then I'm going to burn some bridges. So I'll try to. Who's the ultimate roaster to you? Like, I'm trying, honestly, um, Nikki Glaser is. I was going to say right away. Yeah, the Tom Brady roast, the way and the way that she's done it in past Comedy Central roasts, and just seeing how she's grown, I've really, I followed her. She had a reality show during the pandemic. Um, it was like a ten episodes. Her living in St. Louis. I saw and that I, by the way. It was fantastic. Yeah, it was so random but so fun. I like. I want another season. But um, yeah, so I really loved just getting watching her growth and seeing how she just was and the main thing is just preparation you know she was so concise and so prepared and just like confident and that's the thing too yeah being able to confidently say it and not feel bad 
so, so you said you don't like the roasting, obviously. Um, what about, uh, so you said you started off doing some improv, right? Is that where you started out doing comedy? Is that where you kind of got into it? Uh, yes. So I started improv way back in high school, mm -hmm. um, doing the short form Whose Line Is It style games. Oh, yeah. And in college, I joined the improv team as a freshman. And by my junior year, we formed um, the long form team where we followed the model of IO and Second City and the main improv mm -hmm. schools. Um, and then I moved to Chicago and I <laughs> went to improv school. Um, so I have three improv degrees. I, I, I wouldn't call them a degree, but you know, <laughs> three certifications um now and then i interned at um at washington improv theater in dc so i was really into improv for a very long time amy poehler and tina fey were my idols and i really wanted to follow their footsteps of doing improv but then going on snl and right yeah and so chicago was the place to go and that's where i started off for a few years so you went from nebraska to chicago to DC and then LA? I did DC before Chicago. Okay. So you, you pretty much have lived on tour to get to LA pretty much is what it seems like, you know, like you've already done a tour. <laughs> it seems like, like why LA? I mean, I'm sure that's the obvious answer, but why LA for you? Well, my brother lived here, my older brother. So I had family here. Um, I had already lived in Chicago for a bit and I could continue with that, but I think I was just looking for a fresh start and an opportunity. Um, this is, I, if this will come up at any point, um, a lot of my comedy is also about how my parents passed away in 2019. And so right after like four months after my father passed was the the start of the pandemic. Right. And yeah. so for that, I went from Chicago to back to Nebraska for a little bit to get their house ready for sale. And that's when it was, Oh, well, we sold the house. What are we going to do? Where are we going to go? And no. so we packed our bags and went to California. Uh, and that was just to, to kind of get a fresh start um, to move closer to our older brother, my, my younger brother moved out here as well. And so that's, that's the longer version, but people, I'll just tell people usually, yeah, it's like, I want to be a star here. I am. <laughs> so. I mean, but that, that actually kind of helps at least for me to know who, who's, you know, become a fan and watching you kind of start out. Like it makes me understand a little more of your, you know, your repertoire and everything and like before i even talk to you like just even from the little bit that i've watched like i know you know you 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 love brats and like you've you got a yasmin doll to heal your inner child and that you love your dog and you know what i mean and so like it's it's, it's like there's these personal touches that kind of make it into your material or, or i feel like anybody's material that that makes it relatable but at the same time it kind of it almost makes you laugh at your own situation sometimes when you hear someone talk about something that you're like, oh, I've been there. But yeah, that is mm -hmm. kind of funny. You got to laugh at that. Yeah, definitely. That's why I like to laugh at myself more than more than anyone else. <laughs> yeah. So how about writing? Like, do you, so I'm, I'm assuming you write all your material. Like, I know how a songwriting session goes. What is a, what is like a, a comedy writing session like like what's that process so i i wish i had a better organized process but <laughs> i do a hybrid mix of i write out loud where going to i go to open mics and i have either a few things that are in, inspired me or a few prompts a few ideas i want to work out and i'll literally just write it as a bullet bullet points and bring up with the paper and just rant for five or 10 minutes and see what comes out of that is where some of my bits come from. Some of them, it's when I'm driving or in the shower, walking my dog, and I make a quick voice note. 
and try to just remember that so that I don't let the thought go away. Mm -hmm. And then um, I do try to, and then I have to chain myself to the desk and sit with my laptop and mm -hmm. actually do writing and actually listen back to my tapes and go through the shows and all of that to see what works, what doesn't. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a, a mega document of all of my, all of my bits that are ready to go working on mm -hmm. just like mere ideas, like just words that I don't even know what they mean anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but I wrote them like at some point for something. Um, so, and then, then it's just really cleaning it up. And then I have a couple, a couple girls that I work with where we do like accountability sessions and we help each other, give you tips on writing. And so much of it come with comedy, it really comes down to just like ending the sentence on the funniest word or the sharpest sounding word. And mm -hmm. where it kind of is like music where you're supposed to have a nice cadence where it's supposed to sound in a certain way where people are expecting da 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 punchline and um, how. Verse, verse, chorus, verse, verse, chorus, bridge, whatever, like, you know, always a sense of kind of knowing where it's going, basically. Exactly, yeah. I've never been a huge comedy, if you know, you, you know, asphyxiado or whatever, but I've always enjoyed watching them from time to time. And I have my favorites, obviously, but some of the things I've also noticed is stylistically, there's so many different ways that people have in their delivery, you know, like to me, you know, like Mitch Hedberg had the one liner, you know, and like, mm -hmm. you know, Jim Gaffigan has the the ghost voice like i always i always call it his inner voice so he's like what are we doing why are they doing you know? <laughs> like but it's this delivery thing now is that something that is like schooled in you going into comedy or is that something that you just kind of develop on your own i think it it's a little different for everyone where some do really some people really do pick a pick someone to look up to and almost model their work after. I think, was it Richard Pryor who was famous for like stealing Bill Cosby's jokes? And he, and he said, he's like, I make more money as Bill Cosby than anyone. So, so why not? Um, and so he didn't, he didn't mind at all, but um, they were, yeah, he was amazing. Um, Richard Pryor, not Bill Cosby, but. <laughs> so some people kind of model that some, and some people, they just get out there and they do open mics and they just work work stuff out and that's and that's what they do for like years trying to build up material and build up their sets that they shop around to the to the different clubs um i took i ended up taking a class actually to get started in stand-up where um some people are like a stand-up class you, you don't need that to do it but i honestly i think it really helped it helped structure things out mm -hmm. and um, she did teach us what the basic the bait and switch and the one liners and mm -hmm. the different styles of jokes and the different ways we can do it. So we wrote different different jokes and we got to see what worked best and what what we felt most comfortable with. So that was nice, just learning the toolbox of it all and mm -hmm. knowing how to talk and the lingo and knowing the, the amateur mistakes to avoid and just to skip all of that phase where we were able to kind of fast track into getting our first set ready and polished and and so that's how I got started um, almost like two years ago. When I watch folks like you up there doing your thing, like I can play music and guitar and a band in front of a few hundred people with no problem. But if I have to talk in front of 10 people, like I sound like Porky Pig, you know, I, you know like I don't. So like. Is that something that has to come natural to you to be able to deliver like that? Or is that something that just kind of either comes with time? Yeah, um, I think it does. It It's something that comes naturally, but it can be trained. Um, and it, I feel like it can be, you can be conditioned into it if you want to, where um, some people they, I know that public speaking is the number one fear. I don't know if it actually is, but that's the, the statistic everyone says about yeah, how it, it isn't my yeah. number one fear, but it's it's up there. <laughs> I know. I'm like, um, I I could name about twenty more things, but um, or yeah, no, I I could sp give me a mic in a football stadium, like I don't care. So that and I guess I just like to 
I like to hear my own voice is what people say, but I actually don't. I think my voice is annoying, but um, I had a, I had a theater teacher say I never met a spotlight I didn't like, and I, was like, I guess true, but um, <laughs> that's why I'm there. That's why I was there. So anyway, um, yeah, so I, I don't mind public speaking, but I did take a speech class one time in college and that I would get nervous and I would get weird and get, get the, the heartbeats and the shaky voice and everything sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, and same thing with when I, I used to play oboe, um, in band and there I would play for a minute and just not breathe the, the whole minute and just, uh -huh. you know, I'd just be so nervous and it would just, um, I'd be so out of breath and it was not, <laughs> not healthy. <laughs> I feel like I was going to pass out if, um, if it was any longer, but if I had to get up in front of the class or get up on stage, um, get up and sing in front of my college classmates, we had like a once a week recital thing that we had to do with the music students. So some of those um, I would get so nervous for, but what I like, what I like about standup is it's yourself and some people don't like when you're just presenting yourself for people to judge, but I would rather just here it's me instead of people judging my acting or my singing or yeah. it's just um, take it or leave it as who I am where I would do I would host um, talent shows and host charity events things like that mm -hmm. in college. and so I never I always liked doing public speaking but um, as you can tell I like talking so <laughs> you know what what we are we are two peas in a pod here because I my ADHD, I can go off the, off the page. Like you have no idea. Like I, uh, like I will actually, I've actually had conversations with a friend of mine before. And he was just like, where, where did you go? Like, what just happened? Like, and I was like, what do you mean? And he was like, well, you started out talking about this and then somehow you ended up with the best way to eat a Swiss cake roll from, you know, little Debbie. And I'm like, <laughs> it all made sense to me, but you know, um, but Okay, yeah, so, the same. <laughs> <laughs> so with the the performing live, and again, I love that you have some music background, a musician and whatnot, because there are obviously is parallels there in what it's like to perform, to prepare uh, in your delivery. I would imagine, though, that being a comedian, how do you handle those moments, though? where you're just like, ah, that did not work so well. Cause you've got to recover pretty quickly because like, you know, if I'm in a band and I'm playing on stage and we do something that doesn't gel great, like we can just go into another song, you know what I mean? But like when you're up there with a mic by yourself and something just kind of like, you're just like, Ooh, like you don't have time. Right. Like, how do you, how do you do that? And how do you like, I don't know, how do you internalize that and, and, and work with that later? I think some people are so good at rolling with it where they can continue on. Some people, they do say that was the punchline if people don't laugh <laughs> and then people will laugh. <laughs> um, and it's a whole, there's a whole genre of people laughing at people bombing, which you don't want to be, that's not good laughter to have, but at least people are laughing, I guess. <laughs> right. Uh, but this, this, this happened to me last night where I changed my, I had, um, I was performing at the Burbank Comedy Festival and, um, and I was a little flustered or whatever coming in and I didn't have enough time to really settle in. I changed my set last minute because um, it was clean, like it was late night TV clean, but it wasn't it wasn't what you would tell to your in-laws clean material. And then when I saw the crowd and I saw the audience, it like veered a little bit older and I, well, I was like, I don't think they're going to like um, my like STD jokes and stuff. So I, <laughs> I, I was like, let's change this up. Um, so I last minute pulled out some old jokes and it was just a little, a little wonky um, pulling. And so there was one joke that it didn't quite land. And then you try to say something to make it land more or like, oh, I guess that's why blah, blah, blah. That didn't get a laugh. <laughs> and then you just have to. <laughs> take a breath and move on. Um, but, but some people, some people, I, I don't like how they're like, Hey, that was funny. Come on guys. That's where you're supposed to laugh. And they like really get mad. And I'm like, yeah. I would, I'm not going to tell them if I messed up because I'm the only one who knows that that was supposed to be, <laughs> that's, I thought it was funny. 
I used to tell my bands that a lot. I said, if you make a mistake, don't stop. Like, just kind of yeah. keep going. Because no one's, unless, unless, like, unless you just completely crashed and burned, like, no one's going to fucking know, like, these songs from anything. So, you know, just just roll through it and just know that by the time you get to the next whatever, like, it's already been done and forgotten. I think that's what being being in such a concert setting or growing up learning more the like, rules of the theater and rules of that of concerts where yeah just don't let them know you messed up why because if you if you you know take the instrument out of your mouth and you're like oh man and whatever then of course everyone's gonna know but i've seen bands but and even some big bands to be honest with, like where they'll, they'll start playing a song and then they'll stop and I'm like, why did you do that? Like, you just basically notified everybody that you fucked up. But like, I've actually seen some really great, you know, especially like, you know, folk singers where they might be starting to sing a song. And the guy's like, I don't know how this, how the first line goes. So I'm just going to talk about it until I get to it. And it kind of works it into that repertoire, you know? So there's a way of doing it to smooth it out. Exactly. Yeah. You just need someone who can kind of get it going and smooth it over to the next one. But I think that really, and same thing with with even comedy hosts, where some people can keep the show moving and some people don't know how to, you know, if someone had an awkward set, they're like, oh, well, that was something. Anyway. <laughs> Which is kind of funny because in some ways there's a little bit of charm to that as well. But I can also see that that could some, that kind of thing could also become kind of a crutch though. Like if you rely on that too much. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I have some people do if that, when that becomes their shtick. Yeah. The, the cutesy oopsies and all the cutesy oopsies. So we talked about it a little bit already, but who are some of your comedic heroes? Um, and so Michelle Buteau is, she is what I want to be um, in 10 years. I um, I loved Babes that just came out, Survival of the Thickest, her stand-up special, just everything that she's been doing lately has been amazing, hosting at The Circle. Um, so I love her. Lisa Kudrow is another big inspiration. Um, she, she was a teacher at The Groundlings. She was an improv teacher, actually. Really? Yeah. And she um, she actually taught Kathy, Kathy Griffin. Yeah. Yeah. I believe she taught her. Or something where it's just so interesting, like that world of, oh, no, she taught, it was another co comedian, um, Heather McDonald, that she taught. Oh, oh okay, um, yeah, I'm from, I know Heather yeah. McDonald, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, I like Heather, I listen to her podcast, um, and um, the one thing, I don't want to say their name specifically, but there are some comedians who recently have just been a little too controversial, and it's been a little disappointing seeing their social media and their stance on stuff in the news um and so that's been really hard seeing a lot of the main heavy hitters especially women just um be a little disappointing um ah uh, like a, a musician or a band that i love and i'm like really you you just, you just said you want to make america great again oh why did you have to go there you know like it's terrible you didn't have to say anything you could have just not <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, preferably you would have said something in the on the right side of history, <laughs> but now there are screenshots forever um showing when you were highly distressed and it's yeah, the excuses people made. Um I'm trying to Bo Burnham, he was my first um my first comedy love, I guess, where um I've always wanted to get into musical musical comedy where I used to do musical improv, um so figuring out solid songs to write you know i want them to be perfect if i'm going to do them but i would love to incorporate that again um really inspired by his work kat cohen she also does musical comedy and i really love her um yeah i i feel like i i do gravitate towards like female comedians um but i am trying to open my world up to like chris Vangiola. i listen to i listen to him a lot um he was on Chelsea lately, and so some of those, some of the Chelsea lately comedians, I still listen to. Like I was telling you earlier, like I find myself gravitating. I mean, if you looked at some of my favorite music, especially you know, like if in, in my Spotify playlist, I'd say probably seventy percent of them are female. But because I gravitate towards the sound, I like the sound of a, of, of a female singing voice. I think it's, 
I also like the overall aura and the overall vibe of it, you know, like, again, like I said, like, I'm not a beastly man, you know, I don't need to pound my chest, you know, and so I think a lot of times, sometimes, especially in heavy music, when I hear that, I'm just like, oh, God, you guys are the ones that beat me up in high school, you know, like, for life <laughs> music, and now you're playing it, but you know, I, it's like, if it, if you're like me, it's like, if it clicks and it's good, you just go to it regardless of who or what it is. It just so happens that what clicks with me more than anything is, you know, a female genre of music, you know, or art in general. Yeah. In that perspective, I, oh, I have, I have to do one more mention. It's Fortune Feimster. Love her. Do you, do you know her name is actually Emily? No. <laughs> everyone, everyone in Hollywood is secretly named Emily, and they all changed it because it was too boring and basic. <laughs> that is amazing. <laughs> and I've gone through an identity crisis trying to figure out a better name, but I don't know. So, but see, this is this might be your this might be your edge though. Is it because air, all the Emilies are changing their names that you might be the only Emily? For a while, like Emily Blunt wasn't that big for a while, but ever since like a quiet place, like, I feel like she's been she's she's been growing more and more, and it's just like stop because you can't be the famous Emily. Like I, the, the, there was room for me before, because it was like oh yeah, there's that actress Emily Blunt, but now she's and I, she's always been huge. I mean, by Devil Wears Prada, she was like huge still, but it's not fair. I have looked. I do look when I think of a name though. I do look up if there are celebrities with that name already. Have you already worked out some possible stage names? Like, have you already worked some out? I have. I had a few in mind, but it just. Okay, you got to tell me one. You got to tell me one. I got to hear it. Okay, so the scrapped one, for a while I was thinking about just going by Big Red. Um, as, as a turn off, um, from being from Nebraska, the Huskers, they say go Big Red, the football team. Um, in in the comment section, people like to sometimes say, "Oh, go big red! Is she big red? Or she is big red?" And just all those. <laughs> I'm like, "Fine, I am. Call me big red then, if that's." And and then in my mind, I was like, "Well, imagine a whole stadium of people here to see me for a show, and they're chanting, go big red.' So I think that'd be cool, but it's trying to get people to call you that is a little like I don't want to be like, put it here, I'm big red. So, <laughs> right, or or be like Emily, be like. Big Red. Uh, yeah, I just don't think <laughs> yeah. I have the personality for like Big Red, really. But I wish I did. But I don't think I'm as boisterous. As far as like mental health, we learned a lot, you know, through, you know, Robin Williams, Chris Farley, Mitch Hedberg, things like that, that, you know, mental health, I think especially in comedy, you know, or for that matter, any entertainment is that it could be seen through rose colored glasses from the audience perspective. So we're seeing this one side, but then there's a side to the comedians and the artists and the musicians or whatever that, that are struggling and we don't get to see that. Like, how do you keep yourself in check yourself from having those dark periods and whatnot? Uh, the close friends Instagram story is a godsend. <laughs> So I don't send all those feelings out into the whole world. Uh -huh. um, I'll say that. Um, I, I, I'm newer into therapy where I was a little therapy avoidant with my parents where I should have gotten into it probably right away, but I waited almost five years um, to start. And so that's been a newer journey for the last few months. Um, and you mentioned ADHD. I am working on an ADHD diagnosis. <laughs> so I'm currently, like, I think tomorrow I have my appointment to get tested um, where I had my pre whatever. And she's like, yeah, you probably definitely have it. Congratulations. Because all I can tell you is that Adderall changed my life. But like, my fear was that oh my god it's gonna take away my creative edge and like it it uh -huh. it, it doesn't it it just okay. it, it, it if anything it i feel like it brought my focus in instead of yeah. me being so out here all the time but you know i always tell people if i on a scale of one to ten if i operated at a three now i operate at like a seven you know so okay. it's not a cure but you know it's it's something that'll help yeah because I really, I'll do everything but right when I'm supposed to. I'll, I'm like, now I'll finally do my dishes or let's organize this thing I've been meeting to. And so if I could find a way to actually just lock in and focus, that would be lovely. <laughs> um, and 
yeah, so we're working that out and medication management, figuring that out. I tried living life without it. And, you know, sometimes people need it and that's okay. It's unfortunate that it's such a taboo thing still to talk about in this day and age though. But I feel like I always like to tell people, especially you, I'd like to thank you for doing what doing it because you know, I saw people, the world's better with you here, you know, than it is without. And so we also need to have people that are champions for things like that, you know, to, for other people to hear. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think it is, it is so important to have those, have those support systems because I, I really, I hate to be the cliche of the depressed comedian, but it really is. I think I, so one of my friends, they said, they're like, yeah, I really thought that comedians were just funny and on all the time. And then I met you. <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's, it's just, um, and if I can take, if I, you know, so many people have been there for me and like other artists that have inspired me and gotten through me through hard times. And so if I can make someone laugh on one of their hardest days, like that would be just the biggest thing. This is a, li a little cheesy. This was something over like 10 years ago. I wrote this in some college admittance essay that has been my like life quote. Um, but it's like, if laughter is the best, if laughter, if laughter is the best medicine, then I'm trying to write as many prescriptions as possible. So that actually made my day to hear that because that is really, really cool, you know, and, you know, uh, this was really cool to talk to you about stuff like this because I've never talked to a comedian before and I feel so enlightened right now, but I also feel like, oh my God, like feel kind of inspired, you know, like to know that there's other people out there like yourself doing, doing what we do and that, uh, yeah, even even with things like ADHD or anxiety or whatever, that there's these outlets are still very, very helpful and very much there for us when we need them. Yes. And there's it's there's a community for everyone. And I think that's what's so nice with seeing with social media, being able to find like there's a comic for everyone and and like a space for like someone you can relate to and to find that. So. Yeah, I'm glad that I've found my little space in the in LA and I'm hoping to branch it out into into the world. So do you have a whole routine that that, that is worked out specifically for like a 420 crowd that you No, know, I've been trying to work on that, but I feel like when I just do some things and lean more into like stoner comedy but not like we I feel like so many people have already said the same weed jokes where I'm trying to to come up with something super original is because we've all been oh man I was so high the other day but some of those stories really are the best though they are um but yeah I just I've been trying usually it's more of like my raunchier stuff or uh -huh. um, yeah but not not quite as not the heady stuff you really have to think about yeah <laughs> <laughs> well that's awesome well I hope everybody gets out and sees you and I I'm so excited that we connected and I hope we'll stay in touch because I want to continue to watch you just flourish and grow and you're off to such a great start. And I I've really enjoyed talking to you and getting to know you more. This has been great. Thank you. Yeah. It's been so nice talking to you and I'll, I need to get more out there too, which is, this was a good encouragement for, yeah, that's, I forget that there's so many people that only see me online. <laughs> Yeah.